So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Eric Person, and um, I'll be uh, covering today a new topic. Uh, this will be ballasts, uh, also known as power supplies, for uh, gas discharge lamps, um, which is kind of a generic term encompassing uh, fluorescent and uh, also HID we'll cover. And you might think, well, you know, everything's going to be LED now, right? But actually, uh, you know, I mean, LEDs are, are coming along pretty well, but there's still a lot of fluorescent lamps sold. And, uh, you know, from a cost standpoint, they're still pretty attractive. So you'll see these for a, a long time to come. Um, and what I'll do today is cover uh, what are the characteristics of the, of the lamps themselves? Why do you need a power supply or a ballast? Uh, kind of go through the block diagram, what, what are the power circuits that are used to operate these, um, and uh, look at some uh, kind of simplified models of the output circuit. Um, go through typical operation, because it isn't necessarily just on-off. There's uh, warm-up times and preheats and so on that you need to take into account. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about power factor correction, which... Uh, depending on what country you're in, may or may not, and, and the power level, you may or may not need PFC. Uh, dimming capability, which is something that helps to uh, improve the energy efficiency. So if you, for example, have a, a facility, let's say you have a big uh, store and you have some skylights, well, during the daytime you can supplement with just a little bit of extra light to get the right level, and then of course at night you're at full, full uh, power. So you can definitely get, uh, using dimming, you can get system-wide energy efficiencies. And then we'll go through a summary. Okay, so let's look at um, the basic, uh, this is a fluorescent lamp I'm showing you here. Um, it consists of, it's a, it's a glass tube. Uh, you've all seen, this is like a linear fluorescent, and of course the, the CFL is basically the same thing, but it's wrapped into a little spiral narrow diameter, but they all have um, a tube that is at lower pressure than atmospheric. It usually contains uh, argon and a little bit of mercury vapor, um, and that's certainly a, an environmental issue that uh, these lamps used to have a lot more mercury, and uh, a lot of the design effort in the lamps themselves has been to reduce the amount of mercury because it's a you know environmental toxin. So uh, to be able to do that, um, it requires different uh, electrical drive characteristics, basically. So that's, that's the gas inside of here. And then uh, when you excite that, you create a plasma. And the fluorescent coating is actually what produces uh, the majority of the light. Um, the, the plasma generally produces ultraviolet radiation, and that is uh, what's used to then excite the phosphor. Um, on each end, there are these tungsten filaments. Um, some lamps have just simple electrodes on, on each end, but uh, the filaments uh, give the advantage that you can uh, preheat them and it, uh, it, it lengthens the lamp lifetime. When you start these lamps without preheat of the filament, um, you, you sputter the, the material, whatever, the tungsten, and you get blackening on the ends of the lamps. You may have seen this on some... Uh, lamps if you've ever replaced a, a linear fluorescent. So current flows between uh, these two electrodes basically in a plasma inside the tube. Um, the drive has to be purely AC, right? If you try to drive this with DC, all the mercury gets pumped to one end of the lamp and it turns into a rectifier and you can, can't light it anymore. Um, so uh, you also, uh, you know, there has to be some UV protection. The, the glass envelope doesn't entirely block UV, but it certainly attenuates it. But you do still get uh, a certain amount of ultraviolet radiation out of these lamps. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the heated electrodes, uh, they lower the strike voltage, making the power supply easier. And uh, they also um, improve lamp life by preventing sputtering of the material off the ends. All right, so I'll show you also a variant of this, which is called a HID lamp. Um, sometimes these are also, they're called metal halide lamps. Um, it's, a, it's a variant of a um, fluorescent in that uh, it, this is now a medium pressure lamp, 
So the uh, argon and merp mercury vapor, there's also like metallic salts inside of this. Um, and this operates above atmospheric and the actual, the, the lamp itself operates at about six or 700 degrees C. So not far below the, uh, you know, the melting temperature of the quartz. So very high temperature, but you get uh, a very broad spectrum of light output from this. So it, it's more like pure sunlight. Um, so it's really, an, it's an arc tube essentially, and you have a plasma inside. And uh, so it's a double bulb. You have the actual quartz uh, lamp inside of a glass envelope. Um, and there's various configurations of this used. You'll find these, um, you know, stadium lighting, for example, is mostly HID. Um, and uh, large, uh, you know, warehouse bays and so on are typically HID lamp. Um, and they're, they actually give very good lumen efficacy. Um, you get, uh, uh, you know, good, good light out of them essentially, but um, I'll show you some of the advantages and disadvantages here between comparing fluorescent and, and uh, other lamp types. So um, you can get a lower total cost of ownership. In other words, uh, you know, you invest more upfront in the lamp, but theoretically, uh, you get a longer lifetime. Um, those of you who have bought CFLs at Home Depot and been promised 20,000 hours are probably wondering, you know, do you really get a lower, lower total cost because they don't seem to last that long. So, um, uh, so there isn't a higher initial cost and if they're well designed and uh, used properly, they should give lower total cost of ownership. Um, they provide higher efficacy and more lumens per watt. Um, so, Typically, uh, you know, a, uh, compared to, say, a traditional incandescent lamp, um, you get about four to five times higher lumen efficacy from a uh, fluorescent lamp, and pretty similar for HID. Um, they both require a ballast, or it's an old term uh, referring to like a ballast resistor in an in a arc supply and so on. But, but Really, ballast is just a word that means, you know, a specialized power supply to operate this kind of a nonlinear load. Um, the, the, the difference between the HID and the fluorescent is HID gives you very uh, continuous broad spectrum light, much more like sunlight, um, more pleasant uh, to look at. Whereas fluorescent, it depends. You can get the broad spectrum, but you then trade off lumen efficacy. That's kind of the the, the trade-off is, do you want more lumens, which is kind of a measure of energy, not necessarily what your eye sees, um, or do you want um, a nicer looking color, basically, a, broad, a more even spectral content? Um, so the, the fluorescent is typically narrower unless you specifically buy a full spectrum daylight lamp, which are three, four times more expensive. Uh, because the, the way they do this, the way they get um, the broad spectral content is by putting in different phosphors. So they'll mix uh, a number of different phosphors in order to uh, broaden out the spectral content, but then you lose lumen efficacy. Um, some of these take a long warm-up time. Uh, fluorescent is only, you know, fractions of a second. Again, there's a trade-off there. For the, very, the rapid start, give you um, a very uh, a, a less lifetime, in other words. Uh, you get so you trade off lifetime for rapid start. Um, with HID, they take very long, uh, maybe uh, five minutes to fully warm up. And when they're hot, they're very difficult to restart. Um, overall, you should get longer uh, lifetime. Um, again, this depends not only on the lamp, but also on, on the electronics and the environment they're operating in. Um, Fluorescent and, to some extent, HID are dimmable, which gives you the advantage, again, that you can, uh, you can from a system standpoint, uh, lower overall uh, you know, facility operating costs. Um, and there's disposal and recycling issues because they both contain a certain amount of mercury. So not a clear advantage either way here, but, um, but they're still in wide use today. <clears throat> so let me explain a little bit about why you need a ballast at all. Um, so this is a VI curve. This is not a traditional lamp here. This is a very high power um, 
stadium sort of a lamp. So that we're talking, you know, 400 volts at, you know, 5, 10, 15 amps is our scale here, if you can't read that. It's going from minus 15 to plus 15, and zero to 500 and minus 500 volts. So this is basically looking at the VI curve as the lamp is operating. So you apply voltage. <clears throat> at some point, the, there is some residual plasma that draws a bit of current. The, the lamp restrikes each, each half cycle, and then you get this negative incremental impedance here. <clears throat> the current goes way up. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> the, you go back through zero. Uh, so you've basically delivered a, a certain amount of energy here um, in the positive direction. And you get symmetrically the same thing happening in the negative direction. So each half cycle, the lamp arc is restruck, but you have some plasma conduction in the meantime. <clears throat> so let's look at what a ballast is. I'll show you a of a block diagram of uh, a fluorescent lamp ballast. Um, sometimes the same topology is used for HID, but um, I'm going to focus on the fluorescent now, given the class time length and all that. We'll, we'll, and it's much more popular besides. So on the input, uh, you have your line input. Uh, could be universal, 120, 240, 277. There's usually some kind of an EMI filter. Um, the reason is uh, because you have a high frequency inverter here, um, you know, you can't have the, uh, the common mode or differential mode conducted uh, emissions going back on the line. Uh, some sort of rectifier, uh, I'll show you PFC later, but not every country requires PFC. So uh, sometimes it's simple rectify into a DC bus. And... Um, then there's a control circuit that operates off of this DC bus and controls the output stage. So if you look uh, at the output stage here, um, and I'll maybe show you, uh, I have a better drawing in a second, but it's a half bridge topology and it's driving, uh, you can see uh, the uh, DC current blocking uh, capacitor. There's also a resonant capacitor and uh, let me, Go to the next slide here. So here's kind of what you have, the output stage model. So this is your half bridge driving uh, AC voltage and inductor and capacitor and the lamp. So now would you call this uh, series or parallel resonant? Anyone care to guess? It's not really clear, is it? I mean, uh, so you could argue that, well, the filaments are in series uh, but the actual lamp, when, it, when the lamp strikes and conducts, then it's a parallel resonant uh, circuit, parallel load resonant, right? So your, your lamp resistance is here when it strikes. Um, so there's some tricks you can do uh, with this circuit in order to uh, go through the, the steps of preheat and so on, because you can tell that there is some current going through these filaments at all times to keep them warm, and uh, the trick is, how do I preheat those before striking the lamp? And, and the answer is, I can change the frequency of my inverter and uh, operate at different points along the uh, resonant curve and either drive more current through the filaments without a lot of voltage across the resonating capacitor, so I avoid striking the lamp. Um, and then I can change the frequency so that uh, I get more voltage across the capacitor and ultimately strike the lamp and then find the, the proper operating point. So to illustrate that, I'll show you the uh, operating modes. So if uh, what I'm representing here is, is lamp voltage versus time, and, uh, and I'll show you how we do that in a, in a moment. But uh, if you start out at, um, at a higher frequency, for example, um, the, uh, the voltage across the resonating capacitor is relatively low. You ramp the frequency down and hold it there during the preheat period. So at that point, current is flowing through the filaments, but uh, you haven't, don't have enough voltage yet to, to strike the arc. Um, at, at the predetermined time after preheat, which could be a few hundred milliseconds up to a couple of seconds, depending on uh, the application, uh, then you ramp the frequency down towards resonance and uh, the voltage obviously goes up at that point, 
and at some point you reach the strike voltage and then the circuit kind of dials in the frequency to control the, um, the, the total lamp current uh, beyond <coughs> that. So now you're in run mode. Um, and the, you know, so at that point, you still have some current going through the filament, but now you've really got your uh, power going through the plasma and the lamp. So that's what the ballast has to do, is it has to, uh, has to recognize a startup, um, preheat the lamp filaments, uh, ignite the plasma, and then operate at the correct power level. And not only that, but handle brownout conditions and uh, all sorts of other, uh, you know, uh, line disturbances as well. So here's a, kind of what a typical circuit might look like. Uh, this is without any PFC. So there's uh, some sort of a fuse or a, Sometimes it just a, a, a resistor is used here um, as a fusible element because it's cheaper. <laughs> um, and there's a filter capacitor and an inductor. Uh, sometimes you'd have this, this inductor split in half to give a little bit better common mode. But, you know, remember these are things that where every fraction of a penny is counted. So having two inductors is more expensive than one. So if they can get by with one, they will. Um, bridge rectifier, then you end up with your DC bus. Um, so if it's rectified off of our traditional line voltage here, you'd have about a 170 volt bus. Um, so this is, uh, let's say, plus 170, and this is essentially zero. And then you see the half bridge. Um, there's a little control IC here that operates with a dropping resistor. Uh, this is enough to get the circuit up and running. Um, but once it's running, then there's a little uh, kind of a charge pump here. The snubber capacitor and diode uh, provides little pulses of energy each cycle to help power the IC. And therefore, you, you don't need such a big, um, you don't need so much current going through this dissipative uh, resistor. Usually, the IC has a built-in, like a zener um, from, uh, you know, across right here. So if you put a little bit too much uh, current into it, it just clamps and holds the level there so it doesn't destroy itself. Um, on the half bridge side, you've got uh, you know, traditional high and low side end channel FETs. This little bootstrap capacitor here is uh, powered, uh, you know, it, this, this is the, there's an internal uh, bootstrap diode. Uh, I guess I'll draw it here just so you remember from our FET drive lecture. Um, so every time this node goes to zero, the capacitor is charged up to VCC. So this has roughly 15 volts across it. And when you turn on the high side, then this node goes up to <coughs> 170. So this is at 185. So you, you have a, a little storage reservoir here to power the high side. Uh, that's how you can get by with an end channel FET. Then the resonant circuit. Um, you have your resonating inductor, resonating capacitor, and DC blocking capacitor um, that all go in series with the lamp. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, not everyone uses uh, an integrated circuit. Actually, the, most often these are implemented with very crude uh, self-oscillating uh, you know, circuits with a saturable transformer and uh, some bipolar transistors that are, uh, you know, fractions of a penny. So um, cost is extremely uh, important in uh, these kind of circuits. So uh, power factor correction. Um, in some applications, and particularly in Europe at just about any power level, uh, you need to have um, sinusoidal input current, or at least reduced harmonic input current. And the, the easiest way to do that is with boost, uh, traditional boost PFC. So again, you have an EMI filter, maybe a little bit uh, sturdier this time because now you've got uh, multiple um, switching power stages. Uh, you rectify again, so here you have rectified full wave uh, bus voltage. Um, and the boost PFC now drives to a higher, typically this is gonna make a universal input, so this will be a, like a 380 volt bus. 
And so it gives you a whole different class of lamps you can now drive because uh, even as the input varies in, in voltage, you're able to maintain a, um, a, a fixed DC bus voltage. And then this is all the same. Usually there, there are uh, fault circuits here that detect, they measure uh, lamp current, lamp voltage, and so on. And the control chip, um, besides operating the PFC and operating the inverter, uh, keeps track of any faults to make sure that uh, if the lamp is broken or out or something that it, uh, it'll retry and then give up and shut down. So the most common method of, of doing PFC uh, is, at this power level, is um, critical conduction mode, um, which means that you, you store energy in the uh, inductor, you, you ramp current up, um, and then you turn off the switch and the inductor discharges um, through the, the uh, boost diode completely until all of its energy is gone. And that means that when you then turn the switch back on, you don't have reverse recovery issues with this diode. So um, it, at low power levels, this is an efficient and low cost way to, to get uh, sinusoidal current. This, this is showing the peak of the, um, of the inductor current. And then this is the average here. So um, this is a, it's not a fixed frequency necessarily. It varies a bit, but um, you essentially you know, turn on the inductor and the control circuit goes up to 2x the desired current, lets it ramp back down to zero, at which point it turns back on over and over again, operating at uh, anywhere from 20, 30 kilohertz up to maybe 100 kilohertz in that region. Um, so it's a very low cost way to get PFC and it's, you don't need an expensive diode here, you need a pretty standard uh, boost diode uh, because it's zero current switching, you don't um, have reverse recovery. So I mentioned um, dimming and um, so especially for like linear fluorescent lamps that are used extensively, I know you've, you've got them here. I don't know if these are dimming, but um, uh, it's something that, again, from a system and facility standpoint, helps you save energy. So circuits the same, EMI filter, rectifier, typically PFC, um, and then there's some sort of an interface. Um, some of these are set up to actually operate with the traditional old triac dimming, you know, the light switch dimmers you can have. So their input line, if, if, if this is operating as a triac dimmer, it means that the uh, input voltage is looking something like this. You know, it's chopped, you know, and here's the, the missing phase angle here, right? So um, the, the light dimmer type of uh, triac circuit gives you this uh, discontinuous uh, uh, partial sine wave driving the input. It makes it very challenging to operate this circuit because as the phase cut gets greater and greater, you have very little voltage to work with. So um, it can be done, but it's not inexpensive. Um, the better way to do this is to have you know, some sort of a remote control. It could be Zigbee or some other uh, interface protocol and uh, an isolated interface that goes to your overall ballast control chip. Um, this is, uh, especially in larger facilities, this is how it's done. Um, so I'll show you uh, the dimming output stage. It's actually, I guess, the, the output stage itself is, is really the same. Um, but uh, as what, what, what happens is that as you change the, um, the voltage and the, the phase angle between voltage and current in this um, resonant circuit, the effective lamp resistance changes, right? Because it's conducting less and less. So the Q changes quite a bit, and I'll show you that in a minute, how that works. Um, don't worry, this won't be on the test here. <laughs> so, um, but what I wanted to show you is that the, you have an, an LC resonant circuit where R, not only is it nonlinear because it's a, um, you know, the lamp that restrikes, so you have to kind of look at an average uh, resistance, but as you try to dim this, um, R changes, even the average changes. 
And then you can also take into account these, um, uh, this R could be thought of as the, uh, the ESR of the inductor. This is a filament, this is the other filament, um, and so on. You've got, uh, you know, or actually this could be the ESR of the capacitor on the other side of the filament. But, um, so it's a complex circuit, uh, not linear. And here's what the, uh, the transfer function looks like, if you can see that. So basically, um, what you're looking at here is this is the, the magnitude uh, of the, let me, let me redraw the circuit here so you know what we're talking about. So this is the L and C, right, that's being driven by our half bridge. And the, the lamp is essentially across this. I'll just draw it without the filaments here. Right, so, so it's parallel resonant. And what I'm talking about, the magnitude here, is the, the voltage magnitude across the capacitor or across the lamp. So if the, if the lamp is essentially an open circuit, so zero damping, um, then at resonance, this is my, my resonant frequency right here, um, I get an enormous, you know, infinite magnitude theoretically here as I excite the uh, LC circuit, I'll get, uh, you know, very large um, voltage across the lamp. So that's how I can strike it. So what we typically do is we operate, um, let me just see if I have another slide. No, so you, when you begin operation, you start at a high frequency. So you turn on somewhere, let's say here, um, where the voltage is not very high. Um, you're actually above resonance, and I can now, uh, I can control current by moving up or down this, this curve. And so that's how I preheat the lamp is by operating above resonance. Then to strike the lamp, I move the frequency down until I hit the point where um, I have enough voltage to strike the lamp. And at that point, um, the, the characteristic changes. If I'm operating at full power, I now have a, probably an overdamped circuit. And you know, the, the lamp, once the lamp is strike uh, or struck, once the amp is, lamp is lit, um, the operating voltage is quite a bit lower. For example, it may take, you know, hundreds of volts to strike it, but then only 30, 40 volts to actually operate. So, um, so once so you, you follow this trajectory, you go up this way to strike, and then instantly down to someplace here, and now I can regulate the overall current by, again, by shifting frequency. Um, as I dim, though this, this transfer character doesn't say the same, it actually shifts quite a bit. So it's a, it's a difficult control uh, circuit to, to get right. And um, that's why dimming ballasts are not inexpensive. Uh, this is just showing phase here. So if I look at, whoops. Um, how I can control uh, lamp power by adjusting the phase of the uh, current and voltage in the circuit operating above resonance. And again, don't worry about the equation. That's just um, showing the form of it, that uh, the phase actually goes, you've got uh, terms that have uh, frequency uh, directly and also the cube of frequency. But overall, it's pretty linear that the, the power uh, as the uh, phase between voltage and current is changed, you get a nice linear uh, uh, change in power. So this is essentially how dimming ballasts operate, is they use phase control um, above resonance. And just to show you a little block diagram, <clears throat> um, it essentially uses a voltage-controlled oscillator that drives the output stage um, there's an integrator that uh, basically compares a reference phase to the feedback phase. Um, it goes through a little compensation circuit, uh, just very traditional feedback, only um, you're, you're looking at uh, the phase of current rather than uh, the actual lamp voltage. So just show you a typical characteristic of a lamp that uh, is dimmed or dimmable. Uh, this is a, you can go buy these at Home Depot, 32 watt T8 lamp. 
Um, operating voltage here, um, this is a, a high voltage lamp, so this is uh, in the range of 200 to 250 volts essentially. And that's all the way from like 10% power up to full power. So, you know, 30 some watts here and 5, 4, 3. So this is even less than 10%. So the, the voltage is fairly um, constant, um, and uh, you can operate it all the way down to, uh, you know, down to one watt. Um, and in order to do that, though, you still need to keep the, the, uh, the filaments hot, because uh, as the lamp dims, it won't restrike if the filaments aren't hot. So it's uh, another important you know, the multi-dimensional design criteria you have to worry about is making sure the filament current is hot, uh, or hot, uh, high enough to keep it hot. So I'll show you um, some waveforms here. Uh, this is just from a typical lamp, uh, fluorescent lamp ballast. So at power up, uh, the, the, the circuit VCC comes up, and um, and then once it does, the um, the power factor correction circuit begins operating, and the inverter begins operating. So this is just a normal power up sequence. There's a little delay while it charges, does a pre charge, and then begins operating. Um, during the preheat region, we're looking at the voltage here across the cathode. the The current is actually fixed. Let's look at the current first. So once once the circuit begins operating. This then starts at the, remember the frequency now, this is preheat, so the, the lamp is operating here in the preheat mode. Um, then it begins the ramp, so the frequency is ramping down at this point. That's why the voltage is going up, or the current as well. <clears throat> and you can see the same thing here, only the voltage is increasing as the lamp warms up. So once it strikes, now you're in the regulation mode, so from this point on, um, you're regulating lamp power, essentially. So this is preheat, strike, and uh, operate. And this is current and voltage. Okay, oh, we're done early today. Um, so on the fluorescent lamps, summary is um, the fluorescent lamps, they give you improved efficacy, uh, which is lumens per watt, compared to incandescent, um, theoretically, <laughs> have a lower to <clears throat> total operating cost than incandescent if you amortize the initial high cost over the longer lifetime. Um, but there's a trade-off between uh, color rendering index, in other words, the, how your eye perceives the light, and the lumen output. Um, <clears throat> if you've seen the, what we call the, the cool fl fluorescent lamps that have the highest output, um, they, they're not very pleasant to, to look at. There's a kind of a harsh uh, light characteristic. So that's the trade-off. <clears throat> the lamp, they need a ballast in order to operate um, because of uh, all the operating modes I just showed you. Um, they have to go through a preheat mode, a strike mode, and a operating mode. Um, the ballast operate in ZVS, uh, so these are operating parallel resonant, above resonance and this is to minimize the uh, switching loss. Um, the, the control parameter is basically frequency, so by, by ramping frequency up and down, you can basically run through all these modes and uh, control the current and power to the lamp. Um, for dimming, you can adjust the, uh, essentially by shifting frequency, you can change the phase between lamp voltage and current and uh, get nice linear dimming. Um, and ballasts are, are, they need to be able to, uh, to recognize when there are fault conditions and uh, take the appropriate corrective action. So, for example, if the lamp breaks, um, you don't want to be uh, trying to, to deliver um, high voltage and keep striking over and over again because it causes fires or, you know, personal hazard. So they need um, uh, protection circuits to take care of that. Since we're... A, a little ahead of schedule here, I'll uh, show you a little bit of um, how a um, <clears throat> uh, HID ballast operates. So um, you have uh, essentially uh, 
uh, PFC stage here. I'll just draw it as a block. So this is AC input, uh, PFC stage. Um, and so you end up with this, uh, you have a DC uh, bus. So this is a high voltage DC bus. <clears throat> and um, these lamps need to operate with current control. Um, so it's essentially um, a buck converter. Um, so you have a, um, a switch, another switch here, a classic. Hopefully I'm not drawing this too small. So these are FETs. And um, inductor. And normally the lamp would go here, but notice this is DC. So I have DC here, I have a buck converter. Um, so this is the, the freewheeling uh, synchronous rectifier. So when I turn the high side switch on, I'm, I'm ramping current up into whatever the load is out here. And um, when I turn the switch off, I recirculate and inductor current goes up and down at the switching <coughs> frequency. <clears throat> I can't just put my lamp here because then I'd be pumping DC through it. So instead, um, it goes to an H bridge, right? And then the lamp goes in between that. So the lamp actually goes, and these are just single electrode um, lamps. So the purpose of this um, H bridge, this operates at low frequency. So these operate at uh, maybe uh, 200 hertz or something like that. Um, something high enough so your eye doesn't notice the flicker. And so the, the whatever current is being delivered to the lamp, um, <clears throat> the it's essentially polarity reversing. It'll go um, in one cycle, current goes this way, and then in the opposite, current goes this way. So the, the lamp current then looks like, um, let me draw it here. So lamp current is like this, goes down to zero momentarily and back up. So it's just a very small uh, transition glitch every time you, you switch the H bridge. So very uniform output power. Um, this is how a typical HID ballast operates. And um, similar to the uh, fluorescent ballast, <clears throat> the uh, Lamp, if I draw uh, voltage and I'll do current versus time. So when you start up, uh, this is for HID. Um, the voltage is ramped up. It, 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 as you power up, you have some voltage. And then... Um, the voltage is, is run up to very high, uh, whatever it takes to strike. Could be thousands of volts, especially at hot. This could be as high as uh, 10 or 20 kV to strike a, re-strike a hot lamp. Um, once the lamp strikes, then the voltage comes down to some you know, operating voltage here, and that this is now the run mode. Uh, actually, I take that back, sorry. Um, let me redraw that. I'm thinking fluorescent. This is, this is the big difference with HID. Um, so I have V, I have T, comes up, I strike. As soon as I strike, it comes way down to some very low voltage. Um, and then it slowly warms up over time and then reaches its final. So the lamp uh, voltage changes dramatically as it heats up. Maybe this could be 30 or 40 volts. This could be a couple of hundred volts up here. The current through it, um, there's nothing up until it strikes. At that point, the current goes up, and it stays high and, and drops off kind of inversely to the uh, voltage. So you, you run a lot of current through the lamp in order to heat it up and because the voltage is low, you need a lot of current. And as it warms up, voltage goes up, and now you're regulating power out here. So this is how uh, 
HID ballast operates. And as long as we still have a few more minutes, I'll mention um, LED. Um, so light emitting diode, if I just take a single LED, um, these like to be driven by a current source. So a typical today uh, high efficiency LED might be um, current, current will be somewhere in the 300 milliamp to uh, 800 milliamp range. Okay, and the the voltage drop across these can be anywhere from uh, you know 1.5 to 5 volts depending on the the technology, you know, if it's to what the semiconductor material is, what the band gap is, and so on. Um, so you need a, a current source, essentially, that's capable of delivering uh, a fixed current um, at whatever voltage you happen to have. And the way you get more light is you can then stack up in series more LEDs, right? You can, you can just daisy chain these to get uh, more and more LEDs and drive them then with a higher voltage current source. Um, LEDs, they have no warm up time or anything like that. You just turn them on and they operate. Um, so a typical LED power supply might be um, flyback. Uh, you've probably all seen this before. I'll just redraw it quickly here for you and of a simple representation. So flyback circuit, so this is your uh, DC, so, so this could be the rectified line, for example, your, whatever your DC bus voltage is. Um, this is a, the, the FET that controls the circuit here. And you end up with, um, you end up with a discontinuous output current. So you can actually drive the LED directly with this. So this is probably the simplest way to operate the LED. Um, but you end up with, so to, to refresh your memory here, when you uh, turn on the switch, um, this is I primary, you ramp up to some peak, you turn it off, and then uh, I LED, on the secondary side, ramps down, not necessarily at the same rate, depends on uh, the turns ratio here. And then you do the whole thing over again at some high frequency. So this is really a coupled inductor. You store charge, you store uh, one half Li squared in the primary. And when you release that, uh, the uh, stored energy then is delivered to the load, to the LED. Um, and again, you can have a long string of these. Um, notice that there's, uh, there's no requirement that you operate these um, with nice DC. You can have them operating at, at these kind of frequencies. But <clears throat> there's a, an area you need to stay away from uh, frequency-wise is uh, 42 kilohertz. Anyone, anyone know the magic of what that is? Your uh, TV remote control. Um, <laughs> So early on, even this happened with fluorescent lamps when they were first introduced uh, with high frequency ballasts is that the, uh, the simple uh, TV remote control uh, receiver would see you know, modulated uh, 42 kilohertz and the channels would change and the volume would go up and down because um, they, they didn't have coding at that time. It was just a kind of a simple circuit. So um, at, this is the frequency that the remote controls operate at and um, to this day. So, Usually lighting circuits try to avoid that so you don't end up with interference uh, between them. Um, and then for, for higher and higher power LED, uh, there are different circuits used where you can use different types of converter stages to a full DC bus and then regulate on the secondary side. Um, so I think you know, LED is definitely going to be the, the wave of the future. That's what you'll see more and more of. Um, and then just one final closing thought here on these lamps in general is that if you look at the, um, if this is a wavelength here, so this is um, short wavelength is uh, 
This is UV, and this is infrared. So this is three or four hundred nanometers up to you know seven, eight, nine hundred. Um, sunlight that your eye is accustomed to seeing has this kind of nice broad, um, and this is a, a output, light output, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term. So at each frequency of the sun is a continuous spectrum that gives you this nice uh, uniform um, rendering of color and so on. Whereas fluorescent lamps typically will have something, they'll have a, a big spike here and they'll have something else here and so on. And these represent the phosphors. Um, this is actually the UV that's coming out of the lamp itself and then these are the various phosphors in the lamp. So you're missing whole areas of spectral content, which is why sometimes things look odd, you know, colors or um, you know, paintings or anything like that, fabrics, they look unusual under um, poor lighting. And so color rendering index, so this is a CRI equals 100 is sunlight. Um, both LED and fluorescent are kind of intrinsically narrow line spectra kind of devices that, um, you know, the phosphor gives you uh, this kind of an output. Because even LED, I mean, think about it, LED gives you a very narrow spectrum. Um, they typically have phosphors as well in order to broaden the content of their light. So this is um, something that has to be resolved yet. I mean, uh, it's very expensive to create uh, LED lamps with, you know, multiple LED dye that have different outputs and try to replicate this continuous spectrum that your eye is accustomed to seeing from the sunlight. So uh, I have no doubt that in the future we'll have a nice light source that's uh, efficient and gives us full spectrum lighting. We have time for a few questions, if anyone has a question. Um, what do you know about uh, the status of basically fully integrating power devices into the control chips future? Reducing cost, you said cost is very important. Yeah, good question. So the question was, um, what, what about uh, integrating the, the power devices into the control chips? So that is done now at lower power levels. Um, <clears throat> You can have on a single chip, um, you can diffuse in uh, various, you know, uh, integrated circuit structures. This is your, your silicon wafer. Um, and you can, you can, using metallization and all, you can interconnect over to uh, some sort of power device over here. But you're limited that it's very difficult to integrate both um, a vertical current flow power device over here with an integrated circuit. So you typically need um, a lateral that. Um, this is done like companies like Power Integrations do this all the time. Um, it works. The, the penalty is that the, um, the lateral device is not very efficient in terms of use of area. So you end up with uh, a relatively large piece of silicon to accommodate the voltage and the current level. But it's still that the cost of uh, or the, the savings of integration probably outweigh that, and this is very commonly done now. I would say at power levels up to dozens of watts is a uh, fully integrated. What's your voltage uh, reading on those? These, so these voltage. can be done at um, at 700 volts. Okay. They're done right now. Again, you know, it takes up some area, but as long as you have a low cost process to do this, then it's still cost effective. And do you guys produce chips? Yeah, so, so my company makes, um, we generally make the high voltage IC that drives external FETs. Um, so the lateral process is something that, you know, others do, um, but uh, it gets down to the cost. Um, I think you'll find if you open up fluorescent lamps nowadays, some of them have ICs, some of them have just discrete uh, self-oscillating circuits, uh, as I mentioned, because that's it's even lower cost. So... Yeah, it's, it's, it's not difficult to do, and it's, uh, it's done all the time. Does the U.S. currently require PFC? Yeah, good question. So the question was, does the United States require PFC now or not? I think there's a limit, and I think it's uh, maybe, Ned, do you know? I think it's 25 watts or something, and below you don't need PFC, something, something like that. Um, I'm not a regulatory expert, but um, I think above that you do, and 
And it's not that it's a go or no go. There are they they have different levels of PFC required. So you can use more inexpensive means. Um, this one called Valley Fill, uh, sort of. Uh, it, it's basically about harmonic current reduction, not having pure sinusoidal current. So, um, but uh, I can steer you to where you can look up some standards on that. Okay, well, I think we're out of time. Okay, thank you very much. Yep, Alex. thanks.